and good evening to our hosts from New Zealand. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Joanna Fountain, who is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Environment, Department of Tourism and Social Science at Lincoln University, New Zealand. She is a social scientist who specializes in wine tourism and cultural heritage research. Today's session will focus on how the COVID-19 pandemic would affect the tourism sector and how we travel. We also have few other colleagues from Lincoln University on this session who will be giving you information about their university after a Professor Joanna has conducted the session. From our side, we are joined by faculty, dean, and students of Faculty of Hotel Management from Manav Rachna University. Over to you, Professor Joanna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Cole. And sorry, I was a little bit late on arriving. Um, it's uh, nighttime here, so um, all the lights are on. It's very dark outside and it's been raining for, I think, a whole week now. So it's uh, pretty wet. Um, but I will share my screen uh, with you. And please, um, can someone let me know uh, if you can see it um, when I get there? Um, okay, so you can, can you see that? Yes. Great. So, um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to talk to you this evening or this morning, uh, where you are. Uh, as um, it was said in the introduction, I am going to talk quite briefly uh, about some of the future opportunities for tourism in a post-COVID-19 world. Now, um, we're in the unusual situation globally where we have no community transmission of um, COVID-19. So all our cases are in managed isolation. And so we are beginning, we're in a situation probably a bit unlike most parts of the world where we are looking now ahead and saying, right, what do we do next? So we're already at the stage where we're, we're thinking about uh, new ways of working. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna start with a, a brief introduction. Um, and then I'm going to, rather than talk about specific solutions or specific opportunities, focus more on some of the themes we are seeing emerging uh, and how they could be played out in a range of different tourism environments. So I will be focusing mostly on um, rural tourism, agri-tourism, so that's farm tourism and food tourism and wine tourism, but the same kind of themes or concepts could be applied in many other parts of um, the tourism industry as well. I should also say that uh, the situation in New Zealand is, of course, not going to be the same as situations in other parts of the world. So the things we've experienced here uh, will be different uh, to other parts of the world as well. And of course, I'm very happy to answer questions at the end. So um, it was mentioned that I'm a, a senior lecturer in tourism management at Lincoln University. I think I, I've been teaching here about 16 years now. Um, as well as that role, I have the role as postgraduate coordinator in the Department of Tourism, Sport and Society. So I'm focused mostly on postgraduate study of tourism. So we have an undergraduate program and a postgraduate program. I'm the course advisor for most of our postgraduate um, studies from postgraduate certificates right through to PhDs. In terms of teaching, I've taught lots of subjects over the years, but at the moment I'm mostly teaching Introduction to Tourism, event management, um, food, wine and agri-tourism, and I'll also be teaching wine tourism and wine marketing in the, in the coming semester. So what do I do research on? As I said, I do research on different types of food tourism. So here on the left, we have uh, cheese tourism in France. On the right, we have uh, tea tourism in New Zealand, uh, tea ceremony uh, in New Zealand. Uh, as was mentioned, I do wine tourism research. I do cultural heritage research. I do farm tourism research and I do wine festival research. So that's just a small selection of what I do. Um, another thing I've been doing research on in the last two or three years is research in the area of resilience. And in particular, looking at um, post-disaster recovery and resilience. So uh, in the case of a town called Kaikoura, 
uh, I've been researching how they recovered, how they are recovering from um, an earthquake in 2016. So that actually feeds in quite well to what we're currently going through, which um, the uh, COVID-19 situation, which is clearly also you know, a form of disaster, um, maybe more um, gradual in its e evolution, but uh, still, uh, how can we come out of that the other side with a stronger, more resilient tourism industry? Um, I'm also a theme leader in uh, a uh, Lincoln Centre of Excellence for Sustainable Tourism. Uh, so we, this centre is focused on how can we ensure that tourism is of high economic value and enriches the tourist experience. Um, but at the same time, we have to be careful that we restore and protect and enhance our landscapes and our ecosystems and our social and cultural values of communities. So we want tourism to grow, but we want, don't want it to do it at the expense of the people who already live here at the expense of the natural environment. Now, of course, this um, centre was set up before COVID-19. So, uh, you know, even six months ago, all the talk in New Zealand was about how do we deal with over-tourism? And now we're in a situation of how do we deal with no international tourism? Um, because as you're probably aware, New Zealand's borders are closed to anyone who isn't a New Zealand citizen or a permanent resident. So it's like, how can we change our tourism to meet the needs of um, our existing market? And within the centre, I'm also doing more in the way of food and wine tourism. So I think I've already mentioned that. So if we think about the current situation and start taking stock, um, New Zealand first started seeing, well, we, we were aware of the issues with um, COVID-19 way back in probably early January. By early February, we were looking at travel restrictions to some countries, and then it pretty much sped up from then. So the kinds of headlines we're seeing from around the world, um, you know, even in April saying this is gonna be the most significant crisis in the history of travel. Um, but we were also seeing headlines related to New Zealand about the daunting future that is faced and what's gonna happen with travel agents and, um, uh, airlines and is this a time to take stock and change the way that tourism happens in New Zealand. So lots of problems with job losses and l lack of tourism. But as April came to a close, people started looking ahead. And so we started seeing in May headlines that said, um, you know, there are cheaper travel deals because we've only got a domestic market. Uh, now's the opportunity for New Zealanders to actually go and explore New Zealand. Uh, we can't go to Australia, we can't go to the islands, the Pacific Islands, we can't go to Europe. Um, so maybe it's time for us to be tourists in our own backyard. Um, and again, uh, some of the e exclusive tourist attractions that only used to appeal to the very, very rich uh, are now, um, the prices have been cut. So now New Zealanders can experience those as well. So, so that has left us in the situation now um, where uh, we need to think about taking stock and um, in, in this situation it's useful to think about what we know about what happens uh, when economies decline, when there's a recession or a depression. Uh, and um, also it's useful to think about uh, what happens when you come through a, a, a natural, uh, a national disaster or period of um, difficulty at a national level. So um, I'm going to look at each of those and I'm going to look at, this is a model that was taken from the article that there's a link to there. It was written by a colleague at a Wellington University here in New Zealand. And these are trends that he identifies that come about with uh, recessions or depressions. So when people don't have as much money, um, what patterns, what behaviours do we see in terms that relate to tourism? So I'll talk about those in, the, in a moment. But the second article, and this was published actually in June, so uh, our restrictions were all lifted in June. So we are now, um, we are free of COVID-19 in the community. And so we don't have many restrictions at all. So this was, this was an article that talked about what New Zealanders wanted, that their, how they wanted their society to be different after COVID-19. So, so we've been through these changes, we've all been on lockdown, um, and how do we want society to look different? 
So what I'm going to do is just quickly, very briefly, um, bring those two sort of sets of trends together and, and, and then talk about how that might relate to uh, tourism. So one of the things that happened in New Zealand, and I don't know how many of you uh, uh, know, I know that India went into a very rapid, sudden lockdown. New Zealand did too. We got 48 hours notice that um, everything, we were going to be pretty much housebound apart from essential workers. So supermarkets were open and obviously doctors' surgeries and things like that, but everything else was closed. So I didn't travel more than two kilometres from my house for five weeks. Uh, and we were all locked down in our homes, stuck in, we, we called them our bubbles. And we were allowed to uh, go walking as much as we liked, but we weren't allowed to jump in the car and drive anywhere. So, so, so some of the trends that we see uh, when there is an economic recession is people start looking at what's important to them and they focus on connecting with their roots. So visiting friends and family. Now, obviously, visiting friends and family, um, we remember the people who are important to us. But also, if you're a tourist, staying with friends and family is often a, a cheap form of accommodation. So you can sleep on their couch or on their floor um, and save money that way. But the, um, the, the, the COVID-19 lockdown situation for us in New Zealand, at least, also led to us spending a lot of time with our family. Um, so the, all of these pictures are taken by me, unless indicated otherwise. So the first picture there, um, early on in the lockdown, uh, children drawing with chalk on the floor and saying how much they enjoying, enjoyed time with their family at home. And on the bottom picture, that's just down the road from my house, a whole lot of New Zealanders just out walking, looking at the ducks, um, walking the children, going for bike rides, and just enjoying being out in nature. So this trend of connecting with roots and visiting friends and family, um, there may also be trends um, through having spent family time to think about further back in our roots. So thinking about genealogical roots, our ancestry, um, our national culture and our, um, our nat nat national heritage. Now, another thing that happened in New Zealand during the lockdown is everyone had more time or most people had more time. And we all took the time um, to bake. Now all those pictures are from my kitchen. So um, lots of time was spent um, by a lot of people baking and making jams and chutneys and picking vegetables, the last of the summer vegetables from the garden. And um, those trends that came about through uh, the lockdown, um, valuing, taking time, slow food, slow travel, slow tourism, walking places, biking places, not taking the car, um, actually match quite closely with trends that we see during recessions and depressions, which is people tend to take simpler holidays. You know, you, you go on holidays where you spend a lot of time just going out for walks, um, going to parks, free activities, rather than spending a lot of money. And those two quotations there, I think, um, from the second article I gave you the link to, talks about some of those things that people enjoyed about lockdown. Um, growing our own vegetables, taking care of ourselves, you know, enjoying nature, enjoying food, cooking. Um, a third element uh, that relates to the simplicity and the search for slow is, in New Zealand anyway, there was all that wandering about outside and we had lovely weather, uh, not like now, um, people were, were, were noticing things in their neighbourhoods that they don't normally see. They were noticing the birds and little quiet spots by the river that they hadn't noticed before. And I think a lot of people enjoyed the lack of traffic, the fact that there was no traffic on the road. So all day you could hear birdsong. And um, because we had more time, we also learned about nature. You'd say, oh, what is that duck? What is that bird? And you'd have the time to look it up. Um, I should add also that we were teaching our children at home through this period, and so I was um, looking after my daughter, and so we spent a lot of time finding out about birds and uh, and so on and plants. Um, so yeah, this there is a sense of nostalgia attached to this as well. That as the traffic started and we all went back to our busy lives, and the traffic jam started, and I have been in traffic jams in Delhi. I know how 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 crowded that can get. Um, a lot of us in New Zealand where it's nowhere near as crowded, but we still thought to ourselves, it was nice to be able to hear the birds. It was nice to not rush anywhere. And so that's another um, trend we're seeing. 
And the final um, bringing together of economic um, factors with the sort of post COVID situation is um, again, when you don't have much money, people take shorter holidays or they stay at home. The idea of staycations, staying at home and just exploring your neighborhood is a much cheaper option than going away. And again, a lot of people um, over lockdown said how much they enjoyed just spending time in their homes and sitting in their gardens that they don't spend enough time at home. It's always just a place where you sleep and then you go out to work or you go out to socialize. Um, and also New Zealanders were very proud of how well we, uh, we, we all banded together in our team of 5 million, which is the population of New Zealand, and worked together to um, eradicate community transmission of COVID-19. So yeah, so this is also coming out that people, um, people seems that one of the silver linings is we've all got to know our neighbours. We have maybe um, gone back to uh, focus on community and spending time chatting to the neighbours and pottering around in the garden. Now you'll all be saying, well, what does that have to do with um, tourism? But I think it provides a lot of opportunities for slow tourism and for different tourism opportunities. So opportunities to connect, that might be connecting to people or heritage or places, um, opportunities to socialise, you know, you know all, all, all this time we've been spending sitting in front of screens, Zooming, you know, it's nice to be able to sit together and share food and share drink or listen to music together or other um, experiences. Um, also opportunities to learn and pass on learning and develop new skills and new experiences and get new understandings of things, all the things that you can do if you take the time. And another thing that's been very apparent in New Zealand anyway is um, how important it's, it's recognised to support local businesses and communities who have struggled um, through not being able to open during the lockdown. There's a lot of energy and um, talk about how important it is to buy local, buy from local businesses. Don't buy online from Amazon or don't buy from multinational companies, try and buy local produce. So the opportunities then are to combine these in memorable experiences and to offer inclusive experiences that can involve everyone rather than really exclusive experiences that only a very few can afford even more so um, at a time of uh, recession and depression. So I just wanted to tell you about one tourist experience I had recently that I think captures this idea of the slow. So um, this is at one of the beaches in Christchurch. This is in summer, but it wasn't a particularly warm day. Um, and my daughter and I went on this experience where we got to uh, whittle or carve um, a spoon from driftwood on the beach. So the first thing we did is we went down to the beach and we chose our driftwood. So we just walked around until we found a nice piece of wood. And then we sat on the beach in the sunshine and carved our, our, our spoon, chatting, enjoying each other's company, getting to know one another. We were from all over the world, enjoying the birds and the, and the sea. The weather had improved by this stage. And then at the end, we had these little spoons um, that we'd carved. You can see my attempt there. And um, the thing about this is it took two or three hours, but it was a kind of slow activity that, um, that, that is quite memorable. And the best thing is my daughter, who said she wouldn't want to do it at all and wouldn't enjoy it, not only did she love it, but when she got home, um, she wanted to buy some whittling knives. And during the lockdown, she made all of those things. So she made a knife and some more spoons. So they are the kind of experiences that may be more popular after in, in New Zealand um, after the COVID-19 pandemic. This was in a suburb close to where I live, so it wasn't far from home. We didn't have to pay for accommodation. It was something that we'd never done before. It was learning a new skill, but also doing things slowly and enjoying the slow. So what other experiences can we think about that might um, bring together the ideas of the slow and the simple and connecting to nature and connecting to nostalgia, maybe thinking back to how our parents or our grandparents lived. Um, and some of the options, uh, gardening workshops. So there are some of these already happening around where we live, but many people during, um, during lockdown um, started thinking about planting gardens. Now, obviously in, in New Zealand in winter, it's not a very good time to be planting much in the garden, but a lot of people said, oh, we really should have a garden. We need to learn more about gardening. 
And of course, in a time of recession and depression, um, gardening, growing your own fruit and vegetables is seen as a cost saver as well. So, so farms or other operators might um, run gardening workshops. Another thing that's become quite um, popular in New Zealand is foraging. So that is going out and searching for wild fruit and vegetables and learning how to do that, not only in rural areas, but also in urban areas. Um, what are the plants um, and fruits that can be eaten, that can be gathered uh, um, from around the streets and the neighbourhoods? Then there's also opportunities for food and drink tours. Many food and drink pr producers are actually really busy and they don't have time necessarily to, to host tourists, but there are opportunities for tour operators to put together packages of attractions to actually take people to go and experience um, where food is made, how food is made, um, how drink is made, whether that's tea or whiskey or beer or wine. Um, cooking classes, that's another option, uh, being able to maybe go out and forage fresh, fresh seasonal food and then showing, being shown how to cook that and then eating it together. Another slow experience, one that, um, that, that could be popular uh, in times ahead. And then visiting sites of production, so actually seeing where the, grow, um, the food is made. Um, that could be part of a food and drink tour or it may be other businesses opening up to do that. So you can see here um, two opportunities. Uh, so one place is called the Food Farm and they already do um, courses. So you can book to go and do a seasonal workshop, learning how to prune a plant, how to choose what seeds to plant, how to grow seeds. Um, and then also um, at cooking classes where you can uh, cook different styles of food or using different ingredients. So um, these are all interesting options that might become more popular. Um, another op opportunity uh, is around wine tourism. Um, now you could replace wine tourism with food or beer or whiskey or tea, um, but bringing together different experiences. So uh, Terrace Edge is a winery that's quite close to where I live and um, I've been visiting it for about seven or eight years. When I first started visiting it, it was just a little pokey room. Um, they were sometimes open, sometimes they weren't open. But over the last five to seven years, they've added to the experience. So they've put in picnic tables so you can sit outside and enjoy the view. They've introduced interesting um, gourmet sandwiches, uh, which means that they can sell glasses of wine. They've expanded their um, cellar door and um, they've also um, started doing food and wine matching opportunities. Now, this is a small family run business who decided that instead of exporting their wine, they were going to focus on tourism. And so tourism has gone from being a very tiny proportion of their business and um, cellar door sales or tasting room sales have gone from being very tiny proportion of their sales to more than 25% of their sales just by packaging these things up. And again, as I said, I think these kinds of experiences are the kinds of things that are going to appeal to tourists traveling closer to home, going out for day trips, maybe having weekends away. And another set of um, experiences that I think are quite interesting is, and this again ties to the interest in heritage. So when I was a child, I actually grew up in Lincoln, so the same town that this university is at a very long time ago. But when I was a child in Lincoln, I had a pet lamb. Most of my friends had pet lambs, but now it's become very suburban and um, there are, there's not really the land or the space for people to have pet lambs and the um, population is still relatively small but it's become just much more suburban. And so I think a number of people might be quite keen to go back, take their children, take their grandchildren to show how life used to be in New Zealand. And farming is the backbone of New Zealand. So many, many um, families came from farms. Um, and so this is an example, this um, guy called um, Scott, um, he's running farm tours of his family farm. Um, it's always been aimed at international visitors. But, uh, he is looking at ways to make it more appealing, particularly to families who might want to go and find out about um, farming. Um, so he started his tour uh, only maybe six months ago, and um, he takes people to see the dogs working on the farm and tells the stories of the farm. But the thing that visitors like most are the stories about that fruit tree you can see on the right there. This is a pear tree that's over 100 years old. 
And um, in the appropriate season, his visitors can come and pick pears and eat them straight off the tree, off of a tree that's 100 years old. And it's a very simple experience, but it's something that um, the tourists really, really enjoy. The only other thing I wanted to say is that um, it's really important when we think about tourism opportunities that we don't just focus on the high-end experiences, that we don't just focus on um, exotic foods, um, foreign restaurants, crayfish. This crayfish here, that's a hundred New Zealand dollars for one crayfish. Now many people, international and domestic tourists alike, can't afford those kinds of things. So it's about looking at different options and maybe options that are more authentic and unique to New Zealand. So this is what we call a hangi. A hangi is a Maori way of cooking. Uh, other cultures have something similar. So Samoa has uh, an umu. This is um, basically you make a fire in a pit in the ground um, and you have big stones in that pit and then the fire is put out and you put all the fo food on these hot, hot stones and then you bury them all under the ground and it steams, all the food is steamed. Um, and so that is a traditional um, Maori way of cooking. Um, and this is my daughter, she loves being in my lectures. Um, this is my daughter eating her first hangi and loving it. And now that little tray of plate food, you know, the lobster on the right is $100 for one lobster, the meal on the left um, with an interesting cultural story and experience was maybe $10. Um, so, so very different experiences and one that more people can afford. And the final thing is um, instead of having crayfish in New Zealand, maybe you can have fish and chips or an ice cream. Um, they are also can be really unique and memorable experiences if you eat them in interesting places and if you can hear um, interesting stories about them. So as I said, that's, um, that's a bit of a summary about um, oops, where, where, where New Zealand is at in terms of uh, COVID-19. Um, some of the trends that are going to shape the future of tourism and some of the opportunities that come out of those trends. Um, that can be followed uh, in New Zealand, but um, it's worthwhile in any country thinking about what trends are apparent and um, how they can be operationalized or how people can be innovative and nimble to take advantage of this, the, the search for new experiences. So I will finish it there. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any questions. Um, If there are any questions, participants may please post them either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Hi, Colonel. This is Supriya here. Um, so um, before we go ahead into the Q&A, probably I would like to talk about and give a little bit of introduction about my university, and then we can get, get straight into Q&A. Yes. Great. So I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, uh, let me know if you can see my screen now. Yeah, great. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good morning. I am Supriya. I'm the International Marketing Executive at Lincoln University. Uh, before I go ahead and talk about uh, Lincoln University, I'll just give you an introduction about our international team. We have Annie Go. She's the international manager. Um, she takes care of uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. She's based in Christchurch. We also have Sheetal. She is the international recruitment officer, and uh, she's also based in Christchurch. Um, about our city, um, uh, Professor has uh, also shared a lot of um, things you can do um, in, in, in New Zealand, uh, but I'm just going to let you know where we are located. So New Zealand have two islands, which is north and south. We are located in South Island and city Christchurch. That's the largest city in, in 
uh, in New Zealand. And Lincoln is actually a township, so we are located 20 minutes away from the city center. Um, if you're flying from India, you can take a dive flight to Christchurch. Uh, we have international airport and you can travel via Singapore. Uh, there are a lot of outdoor activities which you can do around. Um, I have, our students at Lincoln have recently finished their examination and one of our students contacted me and she was sharing all the pictures what they, uh, she and all the friends were doing backpacking and they were traveling in South Island and you don't have to actually book expensive flights to go around. You can either uh, hire a caravan or maybe you can um, take your car. So um, about our region, uh, we, uh, our province is Canterbury and our city is Christchurch. Um, we have four, se uh, four seasons, uh, winter, spring, summer and autumn. So we are right now in winters and the temperature during winter can go from one degrees to 11 degrees. Um, we have about 400,000 people living in the city and they are very multicultural, diverse population. We also celebrate a lot of kinds of festivals, including Diwali and Holi. Uh, South Christchurch is also a gateway to South Island. So to know more about the economic development in Christchurch and activities information, you can always log into Christchurch New Zealand. That's a website. Um, um, you can find that. And here are some of the screenshots. You can see um, how colorful it looks um, during summers or winters or autumn. A great way to uh, just go around and have a good time with your family members and friends. Um, a bit about um, our university ranking. We are the third oldest university uh, in New Zealand and we are a land-based specialist university. So we rank in 350 in QS World Ranking, 18 in small category university QS World Ranking, uh, top 100 in agriculture and recently we have been ranked in top 9 out of 290 institute as per Times Higher Education Global Impact Rankings. Um, we are, um, yeah, so we were established in 1878, so it's a very old university. We've been teaching for almost 142 years. Um, I'm also a Lincoln University alumni, and I absolutely love the campus. Uh, there's so many things to learn. Uh, we have a great student association as well. We have clubs and society for the students. Uh, we, I also love um, the faculty, how supportive they are throughout, uh, throughout your studies and academic year. We have for about 650 uh, staff and um, the student and staff ratio is for about one is to 12. So in the year we have 3000 uh, students out of which thousands are, thousands are international students and they come from seven different countries. Great way to make friends um, and know about their culture. So in, at Lincoln, we have uh, a different area of specialization. Uh, but we have three faculties, agriculture, life sciences, agribusiness, commerce, and environment, society, and design. So Professor Joanna come from a faculty of environment, society, and design. Um, so right now you are in your bachelor's study. So um, I'm just going to give you, a, um, you know, what kind of programs you can do right after your bachelor's. You can enroll to our uh, 180 credit uh, taught masters, which can be either a one year or an 18 months duration program. Uh, we have three intakes in a year, February, July, and November. If you apply for Feb and July, the duration would be for 18 months because you will have a summer break in between. Uh, during summer breaks, there's no studies from November to February. Whereas if you're going for summer intake, uh, our upcoming intake, uh, next intake uh, for this year is going to be November. That's going to be fast track program and you will be taught over three semester. You could also uh, study a two years research master where one year is a coursework and the second year is a thesis. So that is going to be a 240 credit program. Alternatively, you can either um, apply for a postgraduate diploma, which is a foundation year for research masters. So to know more about the entry requirements, um, you can get in touch with me or you could um, contact Estero team. They can help you to get your application started. There's no application fees. And uh, your work rights as per international, um, as per New Zealand immigration, the international students can work 20 hours per week. You can work full time 
um, during your holidays. And once you complete your study of uh, level eight, which is a postgraduate diploma and level nine, which is a master's, you could stay back in New Zealand uh, for three years and you can work full time. So to know more about, I'm going to leave my uh, contact details in the chat box. Either you can contact me or you can get in touch with Dean Mestro. Thank you very much.